Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're about to get started. My name is Emily Vandermeer, and I'm a communication specialist with WWF Canada's Nature Connected Communities team, and I'll be your MC this afternoon. This is our final webinar for now in our Garden for Wildlife series. Um, for the last three weeks, we've talked to you about native plants and how you can transform your green space into a garden habitat for all kinds of species. And we are really excited to end this series on a high note. With us today, we have a special guest, Dr. Doug Ptolemy, whose books have shed light on the relationship between native plants and native wildlife, and in the process have awakened readers to the conservation potential in our own backyards. And before we get started, I just want to do some quick housekeeping. Many of you may have missed our previous webinars, but don't worry, we have posted them online. So if you visit youtube.com slash WWF Canada, you'll be able to watch the past episodes. There will also be a 20 minute question period at the end of the presentation. So please, we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer them. So during the presentation, we have with us Pete Ewens, who is WWF Canada's lead species specialist, and Yermila Bechka Lee, who will be replying to some of the questions in the Q&A during the presentation. And then you may see us mark some of the questions as answer live. And this means we'll be flagging the, these questions for Doug to answer at the end of his presentation. So I am delighted to introduce you to Sarah Winterton, who will be kicking things off. Sarah has over 25 years of experience working in the environmental NGO sector and has been heading up our Nature Connected Communities program since 2014. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Emily. Uh, hello, everyone. And thanks to uh, so many people who have joined us today. Uh, as Emily mentioned, I'm Sarah Winterton, Director of the Nature Connected Communities Program here at WWF, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest today, Doug Ptolemy. I'm sure many of you on the call are familiar with Doug's work. Uh, Doug's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, the author of 95 research publications, and uh, has been teaching insect-related courses for 40 years. Doug's focus on the importance of native plants and their connection to wild, native wildlife is longstanding, and he created a compelling call to action in his book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, which was published in 2007, and he received the uh, 2008 Silver Medal um, by, from the Gardeners Writers Association for that book. He followed up with The Living Landscape, co-authored with uh, Rick Dark in 2014. It was a practical know-how, uh, practical how-to book about strategies to garden with native plants while still incorporating all the social and cultural uses of your yard. We connected with uh, Doug's work when he gave the keynote talk at Carolinian Canada's annual Conservation Network meeting in fall 2016. We, that is WWF and Carolinian Canada, we're in the process of introducing people to our new program, In the Zone, Gardens That Help Native Species Thrive. So hearing Doug speak left no doubt that going forward to engage more and more people in planting native plants and creating wildlife habitat on their property is the right thing for two conservation organizations to do. Today, we're really excited to be hearing from Doug about his new book, Nature's Best Hope a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard, published back in pre-COVID-19 times, just three months ago in February by Timber Press. I think we can all appreciate a vision and a call to action these days that is founded on hope. Welcome, Doug, over to you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Uh, I do wanna talk about nature's best hope today, but before I do that, I wanna to return to last fall. I don't know about you folks in Canada, but up and down the east coast of the U.S. all the way to the Mississippi, all the red oaks got together and decided they would produce acorns in a single year, and that is called a mast year. And they did. They produced a lot of acorns, uh, as you can see here. Well, if you're easily entertained like I am, maybe you picked up one of those acorns and just stared at it. And if you stared long enough, you might see a little blemish 
occur on one side and then all of a sudden it moves and it's very obvious that something is crawling out of the egg corn. And it crawls and it pushes and it wiggles. Uh, it's an insect larva. It's hard to imagine that it came out of that little hole. When it goes to the, falls to the ground, very dangerous time because uh, this thing is full of protein, full of fat. Lots of things want to eat that larva. So it's got to get beneath the ground as fast as possible. And it does, it wiggles and, and squirms again. And about 30 seconds, it is down underneath the ground where it will form a little chamber, turn into a pupa, and then it will stay there for two years. After two years, it comes out and it is an acorn weevil. Now, a lot of people think that a weevil uh, has a big nose, but this is not a nose, it's an extension of the head capsule. And at the end of that extension is where the mouth parts are. And they actually chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. The, this is a female, she turns around, lays an egg in that hole and the larva hatches. And that's how the larva gets down into the center of the acorn where it develops in uh, relative safety. Now you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Uh, well, it takes red acorns two years to develop. So there's no point in coming out before you have a new, new uh, crop of acorns. But that leaves a little hole in your acorn. And uh, nature abhors a vacuum, as you know. So uh, there are things that have specialized on using the holes created by acorn weevils and acorns. Uh, and one of them is uh, Temnothorax curvispinosis. There are a couple of species of Temnothorax ants that make their house inside of acorn weevil holes. When they discover a new hole, they get very excited. They recruit the entire colony, carry in the, the larvae. Uh, they'll carry in everything, the queen, the eggs, and, and within a few hours, they have moved entirely into their brand new egg corn. Now they set up a, a guard here who uh, keeps anybody who doesn't belong out, and they will live happily in that egg corn until it uh, dissolves, which is about, about two years. Uh, well, my wife at this point says, what is your point? What does this have to do with your talk? My point is that this is a specialized interaction and nature is built from millions of such specialized interactions. This one occurs in my yard. I bet it occurs in your yards as well. Uh, and and uh, as I said, there are, nature is, is primarily comprised of specialized interactions. You won't have pileated woodpeckers breeding in your yard, for example, unless you have lots of carpenter ants available, because that's the only thing they feed their young. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees to make those carpenter ants. You won't have 13 species of native bees unless you have the pollen of sunflowers, primarily those, those um, perennial sunflowers, because that's the only pollen that these bees will be able to reproduce on. You won't have platycotus tree harbors unless you have oaks, and on and on and on. So nature is a series of specialized relationships, but today these relationships and nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because uh, as a society, we have not listened to Teddy Roosevelt. He gave us some real good advice way back in 1908. Uh, he was president, of course, of the US and he, he heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the, can, the canyon, he stood on the edge and he looked out over its magnificent, magnificence, I can't say that word. And he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Excellent advice, except in most places, in the US and certainly in Southern Canada as well. Um, leaving it as it is, is no longer an option. There's only about 5% of this area that is anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And that's because we have, we have logged most of these areas, usually several times. We have tilled them, we have drained them, we have grazed them, we have paved them or otherwise developed them. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them and you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies and changed our, our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We have introduced more than 3,300 species of, of plants from other continents. Uh, which have now run amok and are changing the, the species composition of our natural areas by eliminating the native plants. And in short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self, each of which is too small and, and too isolated uh, in order to preserve the species that uh, we need that run our ecosystems. We've done all this because we thought our nest, the earth, was so big we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any, any consequences. But of course, we were wrong. 
And that's why we're having headlines like this these days. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect declines. Um, this one came out just a few months ago. North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And let me remind you how big a number a billion is. A million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 31.7 years. It's a lot of seconds. And a billion birds is a lot of birds. They're now gone. As a matter of fact, the UN predicts that within the next 20 years, we could lose a million species. Uh, and humans will suffer uh, as a result. As a matter of fact, it is not an option to lose a million species. These are serious things, and we have to do something about it. Well, I could go on about the, the pox that we have uh, unleashed upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, environmental benefits to all people. Let's return to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson told us what it means for the rest of life on Earth if we were to lose our insects, and he did it a long time ago, 1987. He wrote this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, uh, and his message was, was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if we were to lose insects, this is what would happen. Most of the flowering plants would go extinct. About 90% of our flowering plants would go extinct, which would change not just the physical structure of, of terrestrial habits, habitats, but it would change energy flow through those habitats. It would essentially halt it, uh, which would cause the rapid collapse of the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, they would all disappear. The living portion of the earth, the biosphere, would rot uh, because of the, the loss of insect decomposers that today rapidly turn over nutrients. And of course, humans would not survive any of those changes. We would be doomed as well. Well, there is good news here, and that is we can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature ourselves, and thus ourselves. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why is that? Well, because we humans and everything else depends on what we call ecosystem services, the services that are produced by healthy natural systems. So this is what plants gives us, just some of the things plants give us. Um, they produce oxygen, of course, we all need that. Uh, major ecosystem services that they, they clean our water and they slow its journey to, to the sea. Once it's in the sea, it's too salty to generally use. They capture carbon and pump it into the ground. That's a very important ecosystem service these days. We've got to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere, lock it up in the soil. And it's plants that are doing that everywhere we've left them. Uh, plants build our topsoil and hold it in place. If we didn't have plants, uh, all the topsoil would be in the ocean and we'd be just living on rocks. Uh, plants prevent floods, they dampen severe weather just some of the major things that plants do for us. What do animals do? Well, they provide pest control services for, for those plants. They pollinate those plants, as we've said. They disperse the seeds of those plants. Uh, they perform the, the uh, essentially the meat and potatoes of the food webs that support the life around us. So designing landscapes that destroy the production of those ecosystem services really is, is no longer an option. It never was a good option, but uh, we had so many natural areas we could get away with it. We can't get away with it anymore. And one of the first people to recognize that uh, back in the early 1900s was Aldo Leopold, considered the father of modern conservation. Uh, he wrote the Sand County Almanac, still extremely popular book. Uh, and said lots of wonderful things. And this is one of the things he said, the oldest task in human history is to learn how to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. And we humans have been pretty bad at doing that. Typically, we would, we would live in a piece of land, spoil it, and then move to another piece of land. And there were so few of us back then that we could, before we spoiled the new piece, the old piece would regenerate and then we could move back and forth. That worked for many thousands of years. It doesn't work today because we've got uh, 7.8 billion of us. There is no place to, to move to, no more unspoiled land. So Aldo had a dream. He called it uh, a land ethic. We would develop as a culture a land ethic. Uh, he knew we had to use 
uh, the earth's resources. We had to, to farm and we had to lumber our, our forests and graze and mine and hunt. We needed to do all those things, but we can do them without destroying local ecosystems. And if we learn how to do that, we would be expressing the, the land ethic that, that Aldo dreamt about. One thing he never talked about though, and, and I wondered about this, is he didn't talk about developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why, but you know, the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist was and is still so deeply embedded in our culture that maybe Aldo didn't even recognize it as an option. Well, one of my major points today is that living with nature is an option. And in fact, I'm gonna argue it is now the only viable option left to us. So we need to get on with it. How are we gonna do that? We need to find ways for nature to thrive in our human dominated landscapes. We're not gonna go anywhere. We just need to wait, change the way we, we landscape. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's first try to uh, talk about where we're going to do that. Um, we cannot ignore private property. Are you in the Carolinian zone? 95% of the Carolinian zone is privately owned. So if we didn't do conservation on private property, you'd be working with 5% of the land, not nearly enough to succeed. Uh, but there are a lot of areas that we don't typically think of as, as targets for conservation. Here are some stats from, from the US. How about power and, and pipeline rights of ways? 21 million acres in, in rights of ways. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, you know the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. Then all the places we live, our, our rural residential and suburban areas, even our, our urban centers, exurbia, those are all targets. Roadsides, down here in the US, we've got 4 million miles of paved roads. Each of those roads have two sides. Um, that's 17 million acres right there. Railroad rights of base. If you add up all of those areas, and there's, there's many more too, that equals 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, plus New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, even adding Texas on there. You add up all those states, 599 million acres. So not having a place to practice conservation is not our issue. We've got plenty of places we can do it. So what we need to do is we've got to rebuild nature where we've destroyed it. And in order to do that successfully, you have to put all parts of nature back. But uh, it's important that we start with, with the most important species, the species that other species depend on, the ones that are contributing the most to ecosystem function. And in terms of, of sustaining food webs, sustaining that energy flow through our ecosystems, it turns out that caterpillars are essential. Not something we've thought about very much in the past. Caterpillars are essential because they're transferring more energy from plants. They eat plant material and then other animals eat them and that's how they get the energy in plants. Most animals don't eat plants directly. They're eating something that ate plants. Most of that something is insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. Uh, chickadees, for example. So you've got the black cap chickadee, we've got the Carolina chickadee, they're all doing the same thing. They rear their young on insects, eat seeds during the winter, but they rear their young on insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will feed them exclusively on caterpillars. And our research has shown that, that um, most birds are rearing their young on insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. And here's a little bit of data to support that. Uh, this is a citizen science project that one of my PhD students, uh, Ashley Kennedy, recently completed. You're looking at the nestling diets of 20 families of, of birds. What she did was have uh, uh, people who took uh, pictures of birds send in pictures uh, during the nesting season of birds carrying food to the nest. She then identified what that food was. The green bars in each of these, these little uh, plots here represent the percentage of the diet, the nestling diet that is caterpillars. And in 16 of the 20 bird families, caterpillars are dominating the nestling diet. 16 of the 20 bird families. Think what would happen if we lost caterpillars out of our landscapes. Well, what is special about caterpillars? There are other insects out there. Why are we focusing on caterpillars? Well, it turns out there are a lot of things that are special about caterpillars. One of them is that uh, compared to many other insects, they are soft. I like to think of this caterpillar as a sausage with a very thin wrapper. And the thin wrapper is cuticle, it's exoskeleton, 
which is undigestible. So birds, nothing else wants, wants to eat exoskeleton because they can't derive any nutrients from it. But that, that thin wrapper is surrounding lots of, of good food. And if it's a soft prey item, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring the, the baby. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, this is what they do. They're pretty, they're pretty rough. They, they just stuff it down there like a plunger. Well, caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our smaller birds do chase aphids. Do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They are nutritious, as I've said. They are, are uh, very high in protein, very high in fat, very low percentage of chitin compared to insects like beetles. Beetles are not uh, like sausages. They are like little tanks. And a lot of the beetle is undigestible. Plus, they have a lot of sharp edges. And it turns out that, that uh, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids uh, for, for many animals, particularly birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids uh, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I am a vertebrate, and you are vertebrates, and birds are vertebrates. And we vertebrates can't make carotenoids, yet they are essential components of our diets. Only, only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get them directly or indirectly from plants. And that's why my, my wife, uh, Cindy says, I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene. Uh, and I have to eat my, my tomatoes to get my lycopene and my whatever that is to get my, my lutein. And she makes sure I get all of that stuff because they stimulate my immune system. And in today's world, that is a very good thing to have a strong immune system. Uh, they are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our, our uh, DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, uh, eat, your, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. Um, they improve sperm vitality. They improve sexual attractiveness. Uh, now we're talking about male birds in particular. This is a male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. So he's taken the lutines, made pigments out of them, put him in his, his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. So those are all good things. Well, where do uh, birds get the, the carotenoids from? They get them from their prey items. But look, carotenoid content is not consistent across bird prey items. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars, far more carotenoids in caterpillars than other types of insects. Third bar are, is um, orthopteroids, things like crickets and grasshoppers. Here's, here's the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies, much lower because they're not eating the green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat the green leaves. And way down here is the earthworm. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does this matter in prey choice for birds? Well, Ashley did another experiment. She put GoPro cameras on the roofs of bluebird houses. And those cameras took a picture once every second. The idea was to catch the birds as they brought in uh, prey items to the box. Uh, and she had a lot of bluebird boxes and a lot of GoPro cameras. And she did it for three years. And she had over a million pictures to go through. Uh, but she did go through. And she found out that the frequency with which the prey item is brought to the nest correlated very well with the total carotenoid content. So caterpillars had the most carotenoids. And they were brought in most frequently followed by those crickets and grasshoppers and everybody else was nestled down here. So all this is suggesting that um, at least for birds, caterpillars may not be optional parts of, of diets. They may be essential parts of, of bird diets. Uh, and that means you're not gonna have breeding birds or at least not very many of them if you don't have enough caterpillars in your environment. So now we need to know how many caterpillars do birds need? There we go. How many do, how many, we've got data from chickadees, we've got data from several birds, but we'll use chickadees. Uh, they need a lot of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees, at least to get them to the point where they leave the nest. After they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days, but they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count that. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of, of caterpillars just to get one clutch of birds that is a third of an ounce through to independence. That's a lot of caterpillars. So, so how do we make uh, landscapes that actually create that many, many caterpillars? This is a new, a new goal. Um, we have not landscaped for cap caterpillars in the past, so we need to think about this. Well, we add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make those caterpillars. That seems simple enough. 
But there is a catch, and that is all plants don't make caterpillars equally because caterpillars are really fussy about which plants they eat. So you have to add the plants that actually make caterpillars. There's a lot of plants that don't make very many. Why are caterpillars fussy about which plants they're eating? We call them host plant specialists. They're specializing on particular plant lineages. Why is that? Well, because plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they loaded their leaves and other tissues with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why when you look outside, it's green. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Um, turns out about 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat plants with which they share an evolutionary history. The ones where they have developed specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses. They develop specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, uh, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But again, it takes a long period of evolutionary history for all of those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. What I'm trying to say here is plant choice matters. The plants that we choose to put in our landscapes are going to make all the difference uh, in, in terms of whether or not we have viable food webs in those landscapes. And I'm going to give you some examples of how this works. I'm going to start with, with our house right here. Um, I am sitting up in this window right now. This is what it looked like when we moved in. Uh, it's now been 20 years. Uh, but this area was, was mowed for hay. It's 10 acres in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Mowed for hay, almost no plants there. Uh, and through a, a quirk in, in, in um, the history of our buying the land, it actually laid fallow for three years. Uh, this is what it really looked like when we, when we moved down on most of the 10 acres. It was a tangle of invasive plants from Asia. This is multiflora rose covered with oriental bittersweet. Now we've got porcelain berry and, and all of those great invasives that I'm sure you enjoy as well. That's my wife, Cindy. She's getting ready to clear that out of there. Uh, so, you know, if you have the idea that, that uh, this is too much work, you can't do it. My little skinny wife, Cindy, cleared the 10 acres uh, and, and Yes, it's work, but she picked at it and, and she did it by hand, by the way, no, no big bulldozers or anything. So you can do it a little bit each day. What was I doing? Well, I was taking pictures of caterpillars because that's what I like to do. Um, what I did was, was bring in the plants that actually support the development of particular species of caterpillars that I wanted to take pictures of. And this is one of them, a Canadian outlet. Yes, you have it up there in Canada. Uh, but in order to have the Canadian outlet on our property, we had to have meadow root. That's what the adult looks like. And that's what meadow root looks like um, because that is the only plant that the Canadian outlet will, will eat. But we didn't have any meadow root. There was no meadow root around us. Um, so I had to get some seed from, from someplace and plant it. And I had no idea how long it would take the Canadian outlet to find our, our meadow root. You know, for all I knew, it had to come down from, from Canada. So I planted it, it grows early, early in the spring, grows pretty quickly. It's about a month, month and a half, I went out to check my red meadow root and it was, it was almost defoliated because the Canadian ally had found it right away. Uh, and, and that was a rapid success. And now I have a thriving population of Canadian owlets and metaru. I checked my, my red metaru just uh, last week and there was a caterpillar on it. So that worked really well. I also tried to do the same thing with the goldenrod stowaway. This is a misnomer. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. Um, it is actually a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. Some people call it ditch daisy, likes wet areas. Uh, so uh, there was a population of Biden's Aristosa about 14 miles away and I went and got some seed, planted them at our house. Took uh, a year for that moth to find our, our plants, but they did. Um, I wanted hackberry emperor because it's a, it's a butterfly that ought to be here, but we didn't have any hackberry. That's what it looks like. So I planted hackberry, I planted oh, six or seven uh, trees of small trees of, of hackberry. Uh, and now 
we have Hackberry Emperor. Even though it's been really cold this spring, I went out and checked our brand new leaves and here's a Hackberry Emperor caterpillar on it right away or already this spring. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, but uh, many of the things that specialize on goldenrod came with it, like the brown hooded owlet, beautiful caterpillar, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is what I'm waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth. Um, this is uh, one of the little shinia moths. It's a specialist on goldenrod, uh, but it's very, very localized. And after 20 years, I'm still, still waiting. Um, so this is this is like uh, this is anticipation. It's it's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. One of these days, I'm going to get the the goldenrod uh, flower moth, and it's beautiful larvae. We also got the the uh, this is the uh, tefritted fly that forms the goldenrod gall. So if you've ever wondered what that swelling was on your goldenrod stems in the winter time, you cut that open. There's a nice juicy larva in there. Uh, and that turns out to be a really important component of bird food webs in the winter times. Things like chickadees and downy woodpeckers um, know what's in there and they peck it open until they get that larva. And that can make the difference between them making it through a really cold night or not making it. So don't cut down your goldenrod uh, in, the, in the fall. Let it stand all winter. I planted Virginia creeper. A lot of people say, ah, Virginia creeper. I think it's a beautiful plant. Um, it's, it's a... Uh, wonderful vine and it supports lots of wonderful caterpillars like the Pandora Sphinx. That's why I planted it. I wanted to track this, this moth. It took about a year, but it came and I got the beautiful adult as well. But I also got things I wasn't targeting like the lettered Sphinx, like the hog Sphinx. Now this is one I was waiting for more anticipation until two nights ago when I went out and um, Abbott Sphinx had finally come to, to our property. So no more, no more waiting for Abbott Sphinx. It's there on Virginia Creeper. Zebra Swallowtail, I want a Zebra Swallowtail because I think it's the prettiest of our Swallowtails. It's a specialist on pawpaw. That's what the caterpillar looks like. Planted pawpaw, we waited nine years because the nearest population was 26 miles away. But they came, we now have our Zebra Swallowtails. But in the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. Uh, we got other things that specialize on pawpaw. I didn't even know there was a pawpaw sphinx and we got lots of pawpaws. And I plant a lot of oaks. Now this is the Bedford Oak in, in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's, it's uh, 400 years old or 500 years old. Um, you do not need a four or 500 year old tree in order to support a lot of, lot of life. I planted oaks, most of them from acorns, uh, and very quickly I got creatures like this. This is a solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered slug caterpillar, the orange headed upacalima, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more came, have come to my oaks. And if you're wondering how, how young the oak uh, can be when it starts to support the food webs, here's a first year seedling um, just popping up through the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating that, that oak leaf. So your oaks will contribute to your food webs immediately. So here's a picture of uh, our house. I'm still in that window up there, but that's what it looks like today from the same perspective I took the other picture. I do have a little lawn there, very traditional, but we have all of those, those uh, moths because we put the plants that support those, those species into our yard. And I'm counting those species. I'm up to, ooh, there's an old figure. I'm actually up to 947 species of, of moths. It'll probably top out somewhere around a thousand, but every time I go out and, and collect, I get something new. And because we have all those species of bird food, we got a lot of species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, 55 species so far. Um, so I would call that a success. But I know what you're wondering. You don't own 10 acres, so can it work in, in suburbia? Well, let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Uh, and they are truly a, a suburban lot. They are surrounded by, by uh, typical suburban landscapes, most of which are, are lawn. Now they put in a lot of native plants and what they call a bubbler, a, a um, water feature in their yard. They had, Kirkwood, Missouri is loaded with 
with bush honeysuckle. It's one of their major invasives. And they pulled out the bush honeysuckle and put in native plants and their bubbler on 0.6 acres. So less than one acre. Uh, and they have recorded 149 species of birds uh, in their, their yard, 35 warbler species. Uh, we recorded actually, we, we got nine the other day. We, we got uh, the uh, Blackburnian warbler for the first time. So uh, obviously it's not the amount of land you have. They got 35 warbler species on 0.6 acres. It, it can work. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's yard in, in Chicago, deep in Chicago. Um, now this is, a, this is a great example of an urban yard because it is one tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average US lot. Um, it is one half block from Chicago's Kennedy Expressway. It's directly adjacent to one of O'Hare Airport's runways. There's no connectivity with preserved land at all. It is a little island. Again, tenth of an acre. Uh, well, Pam added 60 native plant species to her yard and a water feature and has recorded 116 species of birds, including a woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house next to the airport and, and check it out. Well, what about city centers? I mean, a lot of people live right in the middle of the city. Can it work there? Well, in 2014, I was staring uh, at this, this uh, plant, which we call butterfly weed, but we've got to change the name. I mean, this is Asclepius tuberosa. It's a beautiful milkweed. When you call it a weed, that gives everybody cultural permission to kill it because everybody knows weeds are bad. So let's change the name. This is going to be uh, Monarch's Delight. So I was, I was staring at Monarch's Delight and the first thing I saw was a, a megachylid bee. I know it's a megachylid bee because it carries its, its pollen on its tummy, not on its legs. These are leafcutter bees. Well, leafcutter bees have very specific uh, requirements. They need pollen, they need nectar, but they also need soft leaves because they chew out the, the uh, little disc from the edge of those leaves, and then they roll it up and stuff it full of pollen and that's what they lay their egg on. That's what they rear their, their young on. Well, there were red bud leaves there. So they had the soft leaves that they, they needed and then all they needed was a, a little crack to stuff their, their leaf in. And I'm sure there were cracks there as well. So there were two species of, of leaf cutter bee there that I saw in the first five minutes. Um, there were also bumblebees there because there was the forage. So red bud is going to be one of the first things to, to uh, flower in the spring and queen bumblebees need that because they're the only ones foraging for their entire colony in the beginning. So they need those early blooming plants and lots of other plants were blooming as well. And then I saw a monarch. Now this was 2014. In 2013, I'd gone the entire year without seeing a single monarch. So I was excited. As a matter of fact, there were two monarchs there two monarchs flitting around uh, Monarch's Delight um, and also uh, other species of milkweed. Uh, I believe this is uh, purple milkweed. And they were there because they had what they needed. They're trying to find uh, milkweed to lay their, their eggs on. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. And the High Line, if you're not familiar with it, is a, it's an elevated railroad that is now a tourist destination because they planted plants uh, most of which are native. There's our Monarch's Delight right there um, along uh, part of this elevated railway. It's, it's, I mean, millions of people go to this little bit of nature in the middle of, of uh, downtown Manhattan. An amazing success story. Uh, so if some thoughtful native plantings can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, uh, I am convinced that we can do this absolutely anywhere. Very encouraging. But there are four keys to success that we need to focus on. And one is uh, we absolutely need to shrink the lawn. Um, I don't think you, you folks in Canada are as guilty of this as we certainly are, but um, lawn is a huge status symbol of, uh, for, for we Americans. And we have more than 40 million acres of, of lawn. It's a dead zone. It's a dead zone. So uh, we need, and by the way, 40 million acres is the size of New England. We need to shrink the area of lawn. We can still have nice lawns, but we've got to have less of them. Uh, and if we, if we cut the area of lawn in half, so if we've got 40 million acres, we cut it in half, we can create a new national park that'll be 20 million acres in size. And if we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which you know is huge, 
plus the Great Smoky Mountains add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. And if we do it, if we build these natural areas at home, there are a lot of advantages. Uh, it's true, we're not gonna go see Angel Falls in our yard, but we can, by walking out the door, develop a personal relationship with nature at our own pace, at our own time, which is tough to do in a national park. If you go to a, a national park now, you're gonna sit in a traffic jam, uh, and, and be there with millions of other, other people. It's tough to get that isolation that, that you really need to develop that relationship. So you can avoid crowds. It's free. Nobody's going to charge you for it. No, no uh, travel hassles. And as a matter of fact, your homegrown national park is open right now. It is not closed. And you get to experience the natural world alone. This is so important, I think, well, for everybody, but particularly for our poor kids who know nothing about nature, haven't been exposed to it at all. Uh, what we do is we say, well, you've got to be exposed to nature. So we load them on a bus with 30 other kids and a few teachers, take them to a natural area, walk around for an hour, uh, and <laughs> the teachers tell the kid, don't touch anything. Then they get them back on the bus, and, and that's their experience with the natural world. It certainly was not a personal uh, isolated experience where they could develop that relationship. Finally, and I've learned this from my granddaughter, you can hunt lizards in your homegrown national park. Uh, and she sent me a picture. This is how you do it. Uh, first, you have to disguise yourself with leaves and, and sticks so the lizards do not see you coming. And you have to crawl very slowly on the ground. Uh, and, and you have to be serious about it. And you can wear your best dress. That's okay. Um, when I say she's serious about it, I mean it. She lives in Hawaii where her front yard is 10 feet by 10 feet. That's, that's it right there. And the lizard she's hunting is our anoles. They are there. Uh, she invented this little game and she spends a lot of time crawling on the ground hunting, hunting lizards. Um, and I guarantee that's her personal relationship that she, that she has created there. And when she grows up, she will remember that relationship with nature, hunting lizards as a young child. If you're wondering what to do with your kids in, in natural areas, this is a wonderful book just came out by Nancy Stranisti, Nature Play at Home. Fantastic ideas in this. I, I strongly recommend it. Okay, first thing we have to do is, is reduce the lawn. The second thing we have to do is the part, the plants we're gonna put in, in the area of lawn we take out. Um, this is where that plant choice comes in. We have to use what I call keystone plants. Uh, our research, research has shown that, that there's really just a very small percentage, about 5% of our native plants are making up about 75% of the, the uh, caterpillar food that drives our food webs. In other words, there are huge differences among native plants, not native versus non-native, but among native plants, some real powerhouses and many that aren't all that, that powerful. So we need to focus on those, those powerhouses. Uh, so the question is no longer simply are natives better than non-natives. They certainly are in supporting the life around us. Uh, but the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants, the very best ones we can get in our yards? Or do we want ecologically benign plants or, or even worse, ecologically destructive plants? That's, that's the choice we have every time we go to the nursery. I get emails uh, like this about two or three times a year saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, grew in North America seven million years ago? That makes them native. That means I can plant them and everything will be great. Remember, being native is not the metric we're going to use anymore. It's productivity. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon seven million years ago. They produce zero caterpillars. And that's what they always look like, nothing eaten out of a ginkgo. So it is not going to support the food web around you. No life will be where you have your ginkgos. Compared to, I mean, if I choose an oak in the mid-Atlantic states here, 557 species of caterpillars or 557 species of bird food when I choose that plant versus the zero from, from ginkgos. I think the choice is obvious. Now, here's the power of keystone oaks in my yard. Remember, I'm counting those, those uh, um, species of moths. We'll go with these figures, even though they're a little dated. 945 uh, moth species in my yard. Of those 945, 825 have known host plants. So there, there are uh, 100 that are more than 100, 120 that we don't know what they're eating. So I can't count them. But out of the 825 that we do know, 248 species are using oak as, as a source of nourishment. And we have uh, 59 genera 
of native woody plants on our property. That's just the woody plants. Only one of which is, is the oaks, the Quercus, which means oaks represent less than 2% of our woody plant diversity, but they're supporting 30% of our moss species. That's a keystone plant, and that's why we need to focus on them. Third point is uh, keystone plants are gonna work great if we don't have a lot of lights on. Um, light pollution is a serious, serious issue. I, I assigned a, a paper to my, my uh, undergraduate uh, insect ecology class this semester about the, the uh, relationship between light pollution and insect declines. And um, I, I actually was shocked to hear how, how bad it is. I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was, it was that bad. Um, light pollution kills insects in lots of different ways, not just by, by colliding with the light and getting incinerated, but simply through exhaustion, dehydration. It increases predation around the light. It blinds insects. They go to the light, then they're blinded. Uh, so they're not going to do well after that. They misdirects over position. They lay their eggs in the wrong place, disrupts the Canadian uh, circadian, <laughs> circadian rhythms, foraging, mating, and reproduction. These are all not, not good things. And you know what the, the light map looks like out there. We have lights on, um, and we're not even sure why we do it. So here are some solutions. If, you know, people can say, well, I got to have my light on for, for security. Okay, put a motion sensor on it. So it only turns on when the, the bad man comes. And the first thing you're going to notice is how often the bad man does not come. But if that's not good enough, put a yellow light bulb in there. Uh, and a yellow LED bulb, bulb is, is the best. It is the least attractive to insects. So simply by replacing the light bulbs, even if we don't reduce the amount of lighting, um, we, can, we, can, we can reduce insect mortality by the billions, uh, almost overnight if we pay close attention to this. Okay, keystone species, yeah, I don't know what they are. How do you find out what they are? Uh, well, we've developed a tool for uh, um, the U.S. We haven't developed it for, for Canada. I suppose we should, uh, but it's going to be very similar. We call it Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, uh, and what you do is you, you uh, put in the zip code of the county well, where you live, and it will, it will um, bring up the top-ranked plants for your county. So uh, you, you in the, the um, zone should put in, just look directly south of you and put in the zip code of, of the nearest uh, US county directly south of you. And the plant list that comes up is gonna be very similar to what you, you want where you're living in, in Canada. Uh, and this is the typical plant list. Uh, we've got oaks and, and cherries and willows and birches. Notice I'm saying native oaks, native cherries, native willows. You can get non-native oaks you can get non-native, all those flowering cherries, they're from China. Um, you can get non-native, weeping willow is from, from uh, Babylonia. All those non-native birches. Um, stick with the natives. When you use the non-natives, you reduce insect use by 68%. We've done that experiment. Uh, you also get a list of the, the um, keystone herbaceous plants. Uh, goldenrod's always ranked way up there. 110 species of caterpillars on goldenrod. Asters, particularly the fall asters, very powerful. Sunflowers, um, various solanum, and, and on, on and on. So you get an entire list for, for where you, you live. And the old excuse of we don't know what to plant um, doesn't, doesn't apply anymore. We do know what to plant. We also know what to plant what not to plant. Stay away from the non-natives as much as you can. Okay, another thing we have to do is allow caterpillars to complete their development. This is something we're just starting to think about. Now, I live in, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and there are 511 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks in Chester County, Pennsylvania. A few of them complete their life cycle on the tree, like the polyphemus moth. It eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon, hangs from the branch, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. So everything happens on the tree, and I wish all the insects did that. But most don't. 480 species, about 94% drop from the tree, and they pupate in the soil. So the soil has to be loose enough for them to crawl down as a caterpillar, and they form a little chamber and pupate. Or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. And you see where I'm going here. We don't have leaf litter and we don't have uh, uh, loose soil under our trees. We mow it, we compact it. It's no man's land for any caterpillar dropping out of these trees, which means this is an ecological trap. We're calling in the adult moths to lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop and they fall down and, and die. And we're doing that almost everywhere. So if you're, again, you're wondering why insects are declining, another major reason. 
And of course, the cement landscape is, is even um, a less viable option for caterpillars. So I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in cities, not at all, but I would love to, to reduce the amount of cement in cities. This is just uh, landscaping laziness uh, and it destroys our, our watersheds. This is what we typically do. We, we have a tree and then it's surrounded by lawn. Um, and uh, I was hoping to measure this summer, maybe we still can, uh, the survivorship of caterpillars in a situation like this. But I guarantee it's gonna be higher in a situation like this, where you have your tree and then a layered landscape. You've got your, your native azaleas and your ferns and your ground covers. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening because it's a very uh, safe place for caterpillars to pupate in or spin their cocoon. Uh, it's not compacted soil, you're not mowing it, you're not stepping on it. Um, or it could be one of the, the many ground covers that we could have around our trees like uh, wild ginger or may apples and, and of course many others. Uh, so there is room for compromise. This is, this is some good news here. And this comes from a study my, my other PhD student Desiree Narango repeated or completed recently. What she did was look at Chickadee survivorship in the suburbs of Washington, DC over a three year period in landscapes that had a lot of non-native plants and landscapes that had a lot of native plants. None of them were complete uh, one way or the other. But when they had a lot of, of non-native plants, um, that reduced the amount of caterpillars available to the breeding chickadees by 75%. So right away, there were 75% uh, less bird food in those landscapes. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So Desiree would put up a nest box, the chickadees would come and look at it, but uh, particularly if they were second year birds and they had experience with collecting caterpillars, they'd look around, they say, there aren't enough caterpillars here, we're not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs, they were 29% less likely to survive the cat clutches were at all. The produce, nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, those that did survive, and uh, maturation was delayed by, by 1.5 days. You might say, well, that's not a huge difference, but if you put all that together into a population growth model, this is what you get. As a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass in your landscape, from nothing to 100% non-native. This dotted line is the replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die each year. If you, if you make the same amount of babies as, as adults that are dying, you have a steady population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you make more babies than adults are dying, you've got a growing population, but if you make fewer babies, you've got a shrinking population. The point of overlap is right around here at 30% non-native plants. So 30% of your, your plant biomass is non-native, but 70% is native, particularly if it's those powerful keystone species, you can have a, um, a sustainable bird, breeding bird population. Uh, and, and to me, this is really good news for two reasons. First of all, this is the first time that this has been measured for any bird species um, anywhere. So if you're wondering whether your plant choice actually impacts uh, other things beside caterpillars, this, this data ought to, these data ought to convince you. Uh, but this is also a, an opportunity for, for compromise. You know, I looked up compromise in the dictionary the other day. It's not there anymore. That's a joke. Um, actually is there, but, but this is an opportunity for, for compromise because you can have uh, some of your prettiest non-native ornamental plants decorating your yard as long as they're not invasive species and as long as they don't exceed 30% of the of the plant biomass um, and still have uh, a, a uh, sustainable breeding bird population so and to me that's really good news because if I if I went around the country and said you can't have any non-native plants I'd have very very small audiences uh, but it, you can as long as it's not too many can Native plants be used in formal designs. Of course they can. The, the, the um, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal gardens in Europe all the time. And I guess it's okay over there because they're non-native plants over there. This, I got this picture from uh, someone, I'm terrible at keeping track of who send me, sends me pictures, but he's the land manager for this uh, small replica of the gardens of Ver Versailles. And what he's doing is he's sneaking in native plants without telling anybody, here's Joe Pye weed over here, call it a weed again. And his goal is to make everything uh, um, native and then send me another picture. So obviously it can, it can happen. 
Can you get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban lot like this without people complaining? Of course you can, put a little fence around it that formalizes it, it shows it's intentional, it's pretty, it helps the pollinators. Or even without a fence, you have a very attractive uh, planting here that does help the pollinators as opposed to these dead zones here that are doing nothing. This is Heather Holmes' uh, yard. Heather has written several books on, on pollinators. You might've had her as a speaker. This is a before picture, and this is what it looks like after she got rid of some of the cement and put in some, some plants. Here's another shot from her yard, a little fence over here. Um, now she's shrunk in the area that's in lawn and put in a, a nice, uh, nice little hedgerow of native plants. So you can do it. Can municipalities help us live, live with nature? Of course they can. Of course they can. Um, I'm not sure what you're doing up there in Canada, but they're starting to, to do some positive things down here in the U.S. So for example, um, Minnesota has a cost sharing program, um, encouraging homeowners to replace all or part of their, their yard with prairie plants, because that's what ought to be uh, belong there, and the state will help them pay to do that. A wonderful program. State of Florida, um, there's an island of, of uh, Florida, I don't know which one it is, but it's paying residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in their front yards. Um, so what that does is give, give the neighborhood a cu cultural permission to do the right thing. This is a, a listed bird, uh, and now you can be proud for having the bird in your yard instead of um, being embarrassed because you've got a hole in, in your yard. Missouri is, is offering a trading. If you take out a calorie pear, highly uh, uh, invasive plant, they will give you a free replacement tree, a good, good native that is not invasive. Uh, and of course, the dry states in the West, is, here's a sign from California, get $2 a spare, square foot by taking out yard and putting in a xeric landscape. So these are things that, that um, ought to be happening everywhere on some level. Okay, uh, we've made uh, three missteps in the early years of conservation, and the early years is the last century. The first is that we've assumed nature is important, but not essential. We have never elevated it to the, to the, to the, the essential place it ought to be. I was at the Cincinnati Zoo uh, not too long ago, and they had this wall-sized poster uh, saying save wildlife for future generations. And we hear that all the time. We've got to save, we've got to save rhinos and cheetahs and, and so that uh, our kids can appreciate them. Well, to me, that suggests that nature is just entertainment and it is entertaining, enormously entertaining, but it's so much more than that. We need to save wildlife so that we have future generations. Second, we have to assume that humans and nature cannot coexist. Um, and if we, if we stick with that, then it's gonna restrict conservation efforts to all the places that are untouched by, by humans. Uh, and, and from the, you know, the Carolinian zone south, that's not very many places, not very many places. And that condemns our conservation efforts to ultimate failure because again, those areas would be too small and too isolated to persist. David Quammen has this excellent analogy between a Persian rug uh, and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug that is not 79 Persian rugs. That's 79 rug fragments, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our, our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every place has ecological significance, including your yard. So what we need to do is put those keystone plants back into our yards, into all of those spaces we talked about earlier and glue our rug back together again. Make it a functional ecosystem. We're not just making biological carters here where plants and animals can move back and forth. They're gonna live in these spaces because we're going to make them so, so biologically rich. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to just a few specialists. We never seem to appreciate the fact that it is an inherent responsibility of every person on this planet. Every person on this planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. So why would most people have, have cultural permission to destroy those ecosystems? I've never gotten that. Everybody, not just a few scientists, bears the responsibility for good Earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can, you really should think about saving it where you live. I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. 
there's so many very serious environmental uh, problems that the planet has right now. Uh, and, and if I said, suppose I said to you as an individual, I want you to solve climate change tomorrow. I want you to do something today and, uh, and we'll measure the difference of, uh, in climate change tomorrow. It's not going to happen. You could stop driving your SUV, the right thing to do, but we're not going to measure any difference. But if you plant that oak tree or one of those keystone plants or put it in that pollinator garden, you can see the difference. You can see it almost immediately. That makes you a very powerful player in, in conservation. It makes each one of us a powerful player. And it also shrinks the problem to something that each one of us can do, something manageable. Don't worry about the earth's problem. Just worry about your own property. Or if you don't worry, have, have your, uh, uh, if you don't own any land, you live in the middle of a city, volunteer at your nearest park. Everybody has, has a park near them. They're desperate for volunteers. They're all underfunded. Uh, and, and do those simple things we talked about. Shrink the lawn, put in the keystone plants, uh, turn off the lights, put in uh, a pollinator garden. We didn't spend any time talking about that, but, but you know we need to do that. Um, get rid of the invasive plants and that's it. Then you're done. You can maintain that. You've done some wonderful things. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do so is going to determine nature's fate and of course our own fate in the future. All I'm saying here is what my grandchildren are saying to you. You are nature's best hope. Thanks very much. Great, right, thank you so much, Doug, for that extremely inspiring presentation. I feel like all of us probably feel more confident that we can meet this challenge and bring back the biodiversity in our own neighborhoods. And with that, I think we can go and take some of the questions that have been coming in in the Q&A. Um, okay, I'll, so, I'll stop screen sharing now, okay, or, or no? Um, it's up to you. You can keep screen sharing if you like. Otherwise, it'll just be all of our faces. Okay, we'll look at my grandkids then. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably cuter than us. Um, <laughs> some of them. <laughs> okay. So Ryan asks, what is the deal with non-native host plants for caterpillars like dill, parsley, fennel, sorry, fennel for the black swallowtail, citrus for the giant swallowtail, and should we be planting these non-native host plants? Okay, that's a real good question, and it's a source of, of confusion. Um, those plants are close relatives of the true natives, and they share so much of the leaf chemistry that those butterflies in particular don't recognize them as non non hosts so the giant swallowtail for example uses anything in the citrus lineage that's why i talk about plant lineages uh, and even though they've never encountered citrus actually here they've never encountered they have encountered it uh, much farther south um, they can use it because insects find and use their plants all based on on leaf chemistry so if the chemistry matches, it, it works. Uh, so we, you know, the black swallowtail, these, these are very prominent uh, examples, but they're all exceptions. Most of the time when you have a non-native lineage, even if it's a close relative, uh, it's very poor at supporting our native insects. So, you know, you wanna support the, the black swallowtail, you could put in wafer ash or a couple of the, the native uh, plants in the citrus lineage. Uh, and and see what happens. But um, obviously black swallowtail does really well on, on parsley. Also, we bred out a lot of the nasties in those agricultural plants, so they, they really like that. Great, thank you so much. And now we have a question um, that says, I'm wondering where to start and what to prioritize if you have a typical small suburban lot. So yeah, where do you begin? Um, well, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'll just stop mowing my lawn, I'll put in a meadow. Putting in a meadow is actually one of the hardest things that you can do. And, and it's also the most culturally challenging because in the wintertime, it looks like a bunch of, of weeds and they moved out and you'll get sighted and everybody hates you. Uh, I wouldn't start with, with a meadow unless you have the space uh, to, to do it. I would simply plant a tree uh, if you, and, and I would argue that almost everybody has the space for a tree, even in very small yards. A lot of people think that, that uh, oaks, for example, they're all gigantic. 
they're not. Um, things like like a dwarf chestnut oak, you know, it'll produce acorns at, at uh, five feet tall. So there, there are small representatives of a lot of the trees, or if you really have a tiny, tiny lot, put in one of the, the uh, uh, very powerful uh, shrubs, like a, one of the native viburnums. Um, and even if you have a small yard, try to cut that area of lawn in half. The part you keep should be manicured because it shows that you care. You know, this is a cue for care and you're simply adding plants to your yard. Or you could take, you could like that, that picture of the, the little pollinator garden I showed, just carve out a little area of that grass and put in some of the, the good pollinator plants uh, like those asters, like the goldenrod, um, your mountain mints, all the things that the, the native bees love. Um, but I would say start small. Um, I, sometimes I give a talk and people say, I'm going to go home, rip out all my lawn. Don't do that because that's a big job. And then you're stuck with a big job replacing stuff. Just add to this over, over time, make it a hobby. Uh, and, and you can learn how to do it as you're, as you're going. So my recommendation is start small and, and think about adding a tree and then a bed around that tree so that those caterpillars can drop off and, and pupate successfully. That is excellent advice. And speaking of caterpillars, we have a question asking, what plants can we grow in our gardens to attract the largest number of caterpillars? Well, those are those keystone plants. They're ranked based on the, the number of species of caterpillars that develop on them. Uh, and uh, in, in your area, it is oaks are number one. Oaks are number one in 84% of the counties of, of the US. Um, so as you go farther north, you're gonna switch to, to conifers and, and willows. Uh, but uh, certainly in the southern areas of, of Canada, oaks are extremely important. Uh, but birches are way up there, hickories are way up there. Um, uh, what else? Po uh, um, aspens, way up, way up there. Those are all really important keystone plants. Okay, I'm just looking through the questions here. Um, so I have a question also about native Rs, um, that they've heard they're not nearly as positive in the home environment as true native plants. However, they find it's hard to find native plant seedlings while native Rs are far more common at greenhouses. How do I weigh that exchange between a native R accessibility against not being as powerful for insects and plants? Yeah, that's the most common question I get. And you're absolutely right. When you go to a nursery, um, you say, I want a native plant. It almost always would be, um, it's actually a, a cultivar. I've tried to use the word native var and it, nobody will publish it. They say it doesn't exist, but it's simply a genetic variant of a, a straight native, native species. Uh, now, a lot of these, these cultivars are found in nature. And somebody says, oh, this one has particularly red leaves in the fall. I'm going to name it. I'm going to call it Acer rubrum October glory when actually it's nature that produced that, that cultivar. Uh, but others are, are selected for particularly when you're talking about flowers, they enhance the petal size or, or, or change the color. They make a, a echinacea look like a zinnia. And they're doing that because the nursery industry is still convinced that we buy plants only for aesthetics. We think plants are, excuse me, we think they're decorations. We don't care about function, so we have to look for something that looks differently, different every every year. Um, so we did a study. We looked at at six cultivar traits that uh, had to do with the plant, not the flower itself. And the only trait that actually decreased insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple, because that uh, loads the leaf with anthocyanins which are feeding deterrents. It changes the chemistry of the leaf. So try to stay away from the red leaf cultivars. Um, otherwise, uh, disease resistance, um, taking a tall plant, making it short, things like that didn't change insect use uh, in, in a, a consistent way. Heather, or, or uh, Annie White at the University of Vermont has been looking at what happens when you change flowers and the, the news is not as good there because changing flowers messes with the very specialized relationship that a lot of our native bees have with flowers. We have 4,000 species of native bees and many of them are highly specialized. Uh, so I would like to, to see nurseries carry straight species along with those cultivars and let the marketplace work it out. When the, the nurseryman realizes there is a market for straight species, they'll start to, to sell them. 
but they're not convinced at this point. So when you go to the nursery and you say, I want a native plant, and, and he says, well, here's this cultivar, say, I want the straight species. He doesn't have it, say, okay, goodbye. If we stopped buying the cultivars, they would start carrying the straight species. Yeah, so much of that is definitely supply and demand. And for anybody here who lives in Southern Ontario, WWF has partnered with Loblaws to carry um, native plants that have an in the zone garden tag on them. So if you Excellent. go to one of those 35 stores for piloting this and you'll be able to ensure that your plant has been kind of approved by native plant growers and is definitely native to your region, which hopefully we can extend that partnership and continue to make native plants more available. Um, but Doug, you mentioned the green leaves being one of the reasons why a species might be attracted to a plant. Do but how do butterflies find a species? Is it mainly color or is that smell? Is there something else that draws them in? It's smell, yes. Um, every plant is putting out volatile chemicals which float through the air. Uh, and, and well, particularly moths that are flying at night, that's almost entirely smell. Butterflies do use their eyes and, and um, it's hard to tell which they're using more of, but they will zero in on a plant, they land on it, and they actually have chemical sensors on their feet so they can smell the plant through their feet and it tells them, is this the right plant with the right chemistry or not? Um, and that's what their big fluffy antennae are, are all about too. So, so when you change leaf chemistry, uh, you're, you're, the chances are that you're, you're going to mess up these specialized relationships are pretty good. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from Pete who would like to know, how do you truly influence landscapers? Because they are, you know, managing s such a huge bulk of the, the landscape. Right. Uh, um, big challenge. I mean, what we're trying to do is change culture. We all know that changing culture is, uh, is hard. It changes slowly. But um, I do get invited to landscape uh, design conferences to, to the uh, um, ASLA, the uh, American Association for Landscape Architects, to trade shows, um, or at least I used to. If we ever get past this virus, we can start doing that again. So I have talked to a lot of people. And the encouraging thing is there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest. Uh, in the beginning, I remember one guy sitting in the audience with his arms folded and said, you're trying to put us out of business. And I, I wasn't clever enough to think of a reply right then, but driving home, I said, well, wait a minute, we've got 129 million homes in the US. If everybody re landscaped, it's not gonna put nurserymen out of business. It's a huge business opportunity and people are starting to see that. They just wanna sell plants, they wanna, they wanna landscape with them. Landscape designers are very comfortable with the plants they already know, but um, remember, we're not working for them they're working for us. If you hire a landscape designer, say, this is what I want, um, and don't let them talk you out of it, they'll, they'll change. We do have a, uh, an empty niche. I call it la ecological landscapers. There aren't nearly enough of them. Wherever I go, people say, who can I hire that's doing what you say? And I usually don't have anybody. I need to create a giant list that way. So if you're doing ecological landscaping, send me an email, I put you on the list. Um, but that's, that's a business opportunity too. We need to train people who can, because most people don't garden. They simply hire somebody. Right now they hire their lawn care uh, people and they just, you know, even if they want to do the right thing, they want to just hire somebody and not have to worry about it. Uh, and they ought to be able to do that. So, um, but it's also why, why I, you know, I write the books. They're, they're designed to convince anybody, whether you're in the business or not, uh, that this is the direction we ought to, we ought to go, so. That's, that's great. Um, a good question from Anja who asked something similar to that was, how do you talk to that 10% of people who don't really buy into the concept of environmental stewardship? How do you persuade them that they need to take, take part in this, that they have a responsibility? Uh, you know, the, <laughs> I, I have never understood the person who thinks that, um, that we don't need oxygen. I mean, I mean, this is, <laughs> This is pretty basic. The person who says, I have the right to destroy my environment. You know, I hate the term environmentalist as if there are people who don't need a healthy environment. None of this makes any sense to me. So how do you talk to them? 
when I figure that out, I'm going to, I'm going to let you know, but uh, it is a huge challenge. They have this mindset that it doesn't matter that we get our food from the store and, and it doesn't matter whether we have clean air and it doesn't matter whether there are any other species. It's, it's, we need to change our education from kindergarten on up so that people grow up knowing we are part of nature. It's not separate from us. Rachel Carson said, any war against nature is a war against ourselves. Uh, so that says it perfectly. If you want to war against yourself, okay. And why you want to do that, I don't know. But I think it's just ignorance, really, that, that uh, lets that person say that. That's a, yeah. that's a very poor answer. I'm sorry. But <laughs> if anybody has a good answer to that, tell me. Tell me what it is. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult thing to do. Um, shifting more to some plant-based questions. Um, and this one, Pete, I know you're on. Feel free to jump in as well. How worrisome is the fu in the future is the sudden oak death that's happening in the Carolinian zone? It's very worrisome. You know, they, that's our top-ranked keystone species. We cannot lose our oaks. We couldn't afford to lose the chestnut but we killed it by bringing in a, a, a disease from, from Asia. Um, these, are, these are serious, serious, serious problems. So, um, you know, we got the emerald ash borer killing all the, all the ashes. I'm hoping that there is resistance for each one of these uh, and we need to use all the tools we have in our toolbox to get resistance into the population, to save that few trees, those few trees that are resistant. We have oak leaf scorch down, down where I am, and it's, it's gotten into several of my, my uh, red oak trees. Uh, but I see definite differences. There's some trees that have shrugged it off. Uh, a few have died, but most are not dying. And I, I think, um, like the dogwood anthracnose, that really hammered dogwoods about 20 years ago. But a lot of them pulled through, and now the ones that are out there are resistant. So I'm hoping that we can, we can load the landscape with resistant plants and get past these diseases. But of course, the real key is stop bringing them in from someplace else, and good luck with that. So. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And we have a few questions of people wanting to know what are some other keystone species that say are smaller but aren't trees that, that people can trees. start with? Yeah. Um, again, that changes as you as you move around the, the country. So you do have uh, a number of smaller viburnums up, up there in southern southern Canada. So that's an important one. About 118 species of caterpillars on, on those. Uh, we, we definitely have, I mean, there is a huge difference between woody plants and herbaceous plants in terms of their contribution to food webs. And there's a big difference between trees and shrubs. So you, you have to go with the most productive ones. Things like witch hazel, it's a beautiful shrub, belongs in our understory, but there are actually very few things that, that can eat it. There are some shrubs that um, will uh, be very good for pollinators and okay for caterpillars. So things like our native hollies, winterberry holly, for example, Ilex verticillata, it's an excellent pollinator plant, even though it has tiny little flowers, uh, really good for those, those native bees. Same with um, inkberry holly, same with American, American holly. Um, plants like buttonbush uh, are, are uh, I think it gets up where, where you are. Excellent pollinator plant for, um, for pollinators, really great for, for butterflies. And it does uh, have a number of, of caterpillars. Um, I'd have to pull out the list and look look myself and all the ones that I'm, I'm forgetting right now. So uh, the, your prunus is number two on the list. So uh, things like pin cherry is a much smaller cherry. It's not a big tree. Uh, that would be a, a good one to, to target. Prunus Pennsylvanic, I believe it is. Awesome. And we have a question here from Catherine who is asking, um, do things like noise pollution um, in the city, do they have a large impact on biodiversity, um, birds, insects, and mammals as well? And what can we do about that? Well, I don't think anybody's looked at noise pollution in terms of insects. There are people looking at it in terms of birds, uh, and it does disrupt communication. I mean, birds talk to each other through song and chirps and, and just like us. And when it's too noisy to hear, hear your partner, it is an issue. Um, so there are some impacts, negative impacts on reproduction, territory size. What can we do to reduce noise pollution? I guess we could, um, 
make some rules, <laughs> have quieter engines. Uh, I don't know. We have such a huge human human footprint. One thing we can do is is try to um, contain that noise pollution so that it's not everywhere and preserve places. Just like I'd love to see with our, our light pollution. We can have more dark skies initiatives where you, where you have places with fewer lights and, and we can have our huge human impacts in some places, but not every place. But yes, there are impacts. I don't know if anybody's measured it on mammals. Like mammals are pretty adaptable. I know you, you know you have coyotes and foxes right in the middle of cities and they don't seem to care, so. Awesome. So somebody here has asked um, that they now have a basswood or a basswood tree. Basswood. I'm not sure if I'm getting that right. Um, what basswood, species of yeah. caterpillar would that tree attract? Yeah, basswood's a good tree. Um, that That's right up there with your, uh, um, well, I don't have the figure. It's over 200 species that are on basswood and it's a very good tree up there in, in the north. So um, Lots of species of caterpillars. I would have to look up each one that's 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 there. But uh, there's a basswood leaf roller, for example. It's a it's a pyralid, uh, very pretty moth that's very common on basswood. Great. And on to a bit of a deeper subject. We know with biodiversity loss that it's happening at an increasing rate, and it can sometimes feel like we are running out of time. So when it comes to building this natural park. Um, and improving the biodiversity in our neighborhoods. Um, at what rate do we need to do this? Uh, at the risk of being called an alarmist, we have to do it right now. We have to do it fast. We are running out of time. It's one of the reasons I wrote the, the, uh, the third book, uh, Nature's Best Hope, is because of the sense of urgency. Look at these headlines we're seeing. How many more billions of birds do you want to lose before we start doing something? That's a third of our bird population. Uh, so the sooner, the better. The fortunate thing is if I listed the, the top seven causes of insect decline, and as insects go, everything else goes, um, the top six of them are easily addressed by individuals. Climate change is the only one that, that uh, is, is such a huge problem, the individual can't deal with it. But you know where we're gonna address climate change? In the voting booth. So you also have a big tool there. But you know, how easy is it to turn out your lights or put in a yellow bulb? It's easy. How easy is it is to, is to stop spraying all the things in your yard, to stop hiring Mosquito Joe? Homeowners, I don't know about Canada, but where we are, homeowners use 10 times the amount of pesticide that is used in agriculture per acre for no reason. I mean, these things are easy to stop. Easy as changing culture, but we need to do it soon. Thank you. Yeah, it's very timely indeed. Um, and with that, I think we'll wrap up the Q&A portion for today. And we've had a lot of questions, Doug, if you could just repeat the resource you mentioned about where people can find those keystone species in the United right. States. Yep, it's called, uh, you go to the National Wildlife Federation website and it's called Native Plant Finder. Uh, and, and look at a map go straight south of you and uh, it'll probably be a, a, a county in New York state. Um, get a, a zip code from that county and the top rank plants for, for that county will come out. And it'll be almost identical to anything in the zone, so. Great, thank you so much. And I know that another good resource is the North American Native Plant Society um, to look up what is native and if you are living in Southern Ontario's Carolinian zone, if you go to the inthezonegardens.ca website, we have a page where you can find native plants. So that'll include some of the Loblaw stores we mentioned that are carrying plants with our tag, as well as native plant nurseries in your area. And just everybody to let you know as well, we will be posting the recording of this webinar on YouTube later this week. And if you are feeling inspired to transform your yard or balcony into a habitat for wildlife, visit inthezonegardens.ca and you can register. And together we can reverse the decline of wildlife and help grow Canada's largest wildlife garden. And Doug, I would really like to just reiterate how grateful we are that you joined us today. We are so excited to have you talk about your new book and just instill your wealth of knowledge. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Okay, okay, thank you. We're screen sharing.
There All right. Go. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. And if you have any questions, you can also email me or the In the Zone team. All right. Signing off. <laughs> bye. W wine time. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Doug. You're welcome. <laughs>